Well, good morning, church. My name is Tyson. I'm one of the pastors here on the team. And if you are new this morning with us online, or if you haven't been with us over the last couple of weeks, we are in a series that is called Cracks in the Foundation. We're taking a look at Matthew chapter 7, which is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And we started off this series by looking at Jesus' invitation to build our lives on his foundation. To build our lives on his teaching, on his information that he has given to us in this sermon. And so in this series, we are starting to look at Matthew chapter 7 and some of the cracks that can happen in the foundation of our lives. And so if you have your Bible with you right now, we're going to be turning to Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12 say this. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, Whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. Would you pray with me as we've read God's word together this morning? Father, thank you for scripture and thank you for specifically this passage today. We pray, God, that you would open up our eyes and our hearts to see the things that you want us to see. Help us, Lord. Uh, to understand what you want us to understand from this passage of Scripture. And I pray that you would take my words right now, Lord, that you would use them to encourage, to challenge, and to, to help us to grow as a community to look more like Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for this time together this morning. We pray that you would use it for our benefit and for the good of those around us. In your name we pray all these things, Jesus. Amen. Well, Lindsay and I have been married for seven and a half years. It'll be eight years in August. And one of the things heading into marriage that I was not prepared for was how often I was going to be asked this one specific question. Here's the question. Tyson, what do you love about me? I thought going into marriage that I had settled that in our vows I thought that I had told her all of the, the things that I loved about her. I thought that I had told her all of the reasons that I wanted to marry her and that I was good to go. But we get into marriage and, and probably within the first month, Lindsay just stops and asks me one day, Tyson, what do you love about me? And I'm sure that my response was eloquent and I talked about how she was beautiful inside and out, how I'm lucky to be married to her. And I thought that again, that had settled it. Okay, I've answered what I love about Lindsay. We're good to go. But then the question kept coming, and I wasn't ready for it. I'm good when, at answering questions when I know they're coming, or I'm good at answering specific questions, but when the question is broad like that, and I haven't had time to think about it, I'm not great. So over the years, I have come up with a stock answer to that question. And you can feel free to use this at your own discretion, but here's the stock answer that I use whenever Lindsay asks me the question, Tyson, what do you love about me? Here it is. Lindsay... I love your persistent nature. <laughs> you can use that at your own discretion. I don't recommend it. But what it does is it gives me a moment to stop and think and answer her a little bit better. When Lindsay asks me that question of Tyson, what do you love about me? I know that what she's really asking is for affirmation because she's someone who thrives on words of affirmation. And she's giving me actually an opportunity in those moments to strengthen our relationship and to strengthen our marriage. And so I should probably be thankful that she just asks me so I don't have to try and remember it. But I love her persistent nature in coming to that question time and time again. And this idea of persistence brings us back to today's text, specifically to the idea of being persistent in prayer. Earlier this year, we spent a great deal of time looking at the topic of prayer. In our Teach Us to Pray series, we looked at prayer. We dove into the Lord's Prayer specifically, and we talked about how we can grow our prayer lives. We talked about some of the challenges that we have when it comes to our prayer lives. And we looked at some, some examples of specific ways that we can pray so that we can deepen and strengthen 
our walk with God and our relationship with him. And so if you weren't with us for that series, my encouragement is to go back and to check out that Teach Us to Pray series on our website and on our podcast as we went far more in depth during that time around the topic of prayer. But today we're going to talk about specifically one idea from this portion of scripture around prayer. And it's this idea that Jesus desires our persistence in prayer. Just like Lindsay is persistent in asking me what I love about her, Jesus actually wants us to persist, to continue, to keep coming back to our Father in prayer. When we talked about it early, prayer earlier in, the, in our se- last series, we talked about how in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus encourages us that we don't have to have long, long-winded prayers to try and get God's attention. We don't have to have perfect or eloquent words, but that we can actually just come to God simply and be real. And so our encouragement in that series was to keep it simple and to keep it real. And if we stop there, we can miss what Jesus is teaching us in this portion of scripture. If we stop at just keeping it simple, we might get the idea that God is too busy for us or that he doesn't want to spend time with us in prayer. We might think that God has too much going on in the world for us to pay attention to our small requests. If we miss what Jesus' subsequent teaching on prayer in this passage teaches us, we can kind of treat God like he's almost like a prime minister figure in our lives. Now, here's what I mean by that. I think you can acknowledge that right now during COVID-19, our prime minister has so much on his plate. He's dealing with a lot. Our economy is in really difficult shape right now, rough shape. There are millions of people without jobs, thousands of people in hospitals across our country. There is a lot on our prime minister's mind and on his plate right now. And so it would probably be pretty ridiculous for me to go to our prime minister and to ask him for help with a parking ticket. It'd be ridiculous. I think you could agree for me to go to him and I probably shouldn't be expecting a response from his office on dealing with my parking ticket during COVID-19 because he's busy with more important things. And Jesus wants us to see today that when we approach our Father in heaven, he's not like our prime minister. He is, he is infinitely more able to care for each and every individual in this world that he has created and placed his image in. He wants us to come to our Father continually with anything that is on our minds, Sometimes we can approach God like he is a prime minister type figure, that he's too busy for us, that he doesn't want to talk to us, that he doesn't want to engage with us because he has bigger things going on in this world. And we can think thoughts like, my, my prayer request is so small and insignificant in comparison to some of the wars that are happening in our world, in comparison to, the, to COVID-19 that's happening. And we can think that our prayer requests and the things that we are supposed to bring before God don't matter and that he doesn't want to engage with us or care about us as a result. And in this passage today, I think Jesus is encouraging us and he is begging us to come to our Father in prayer. Let's read this again, what he says. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who receives, asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. The point is that, that Jesus wants us to see from this passage is that he wants us to persist, to keep coming to our Father in heaven in prayer because prayer is the breath of our faith. It is the, one of the signs that our faith is alive and well within us. And we are invited in this portion of scripture to persist in prayer. But the irony is that many of us don't bring our asks our askings to God. We don't bring the burdens and the concerns that we have on our hearts to our Father in heaven. We worry about them. We lose sleep over them. We talk to ourselves and to others about them. We might even wish for them, but they don't become asks to our Father in heaven. 
And so the first question that I want to throw out to the chat, and you can talk about this in the homes that you're in today and in our chat function, is simply this. What stops you from asking God for what is on your heart and on your mind? So feel free to chime in to that question this morning. Well, I hope you had some good discussion around that question of what stops you from bringing your prayer requests and your asks to our Father in heaven. One of the things that I love about working at the church is that I get to be this kind of like fun uncle character to so many young kids in our church. And one of the kids who comes to our church often is Pastor James's son, Dallas. And we have this awesome tradition where Dallas comes running into my office and he asks for an M&M because I have this little M&M dispenser in my office that my mother-in-law bought me, and I get to put peanut M&Ms in it, and you twist the top, and an M&M goes around a circle and drops to the bottom. And Dallas loves these M&Ms, and so he runs into my office and says, can I have an M&M? To which I reply, you know the rules, go ask your mom or your dad, because I want to stay friends with them as well. But Dallas runs over to Pastor James's office and he, and he asks his dad and he gets the go ahead and he comes back and he twists that machine and he grabs an M&M. And I love the, the, the just confidence and the persistence that he has to come into my office and to just ask for what's on his mind, M&Ms. And I think that that picture of the confidence of a child coming to their father or coming to an uncle type figure in their life is what Jesus wants us to see when it comes to how we can approach our Father in prayer. I love these interactions with Dallas because he comes with such confidence into my office. And he just comes in and he asks for it. Does this mean that every single time he comes into my office, he gets an M&M? No, it doesn't. It's not that simple. Sometimes he's already had a snack that day or M&Ms just aren't a part of the plan for that day. But I think that the confidence and the the persistence that he shows is exactly what Jesus wants us to be able to come to our Father in heaven with when it comes to prayer. He wants us to know that we can simply bring whatever is on our hearts, whatever is on our minds, and ask, seek, and knock, and our Father in heaven hears us. He wants us to know that this can be a persistent rhythm in our lives. Now, we can't talk about this passage without acknowledging that it has some challenges that we must address as well. We all know of asking in prayer that hasn't been answered the way that we would have expected. We know people who've taken this passage of Scripture to mean that whenever they ask anything of God, God is going to answer their prayer exactly as they expect it. But that doesn't end up being the case. And this is a reality and a challenge that we have to address when we look at this text. And so it leads me to this question this morning. If this is a reality that we've experienced in unanswered prayer, why is Jesus so absolute and so sure here? Why do his words seem so absolute and sure 
that those who ask receive. I believe that Jesus is trying by any means necessary to bring us to the Father, ready with open arms to receive what the Father is going to give to us. Jesus wants us to see the kind of Father that he is, the one that really does want his best for his children. To go back to the example of Dallas and the M&Ms for a minute, every time he comes into my office, do I want to give him an M&M? Absolutely. He is super cute and it's hard to say no to him. But I also know that it's not that simple. He doesn't just get an M&M every single time he wants one. And we could spend a lot of time talking about unanswered prayer in relation to this scripture this morning. But my encouragement to you this morning is if you're wrestling with unanswered prayer, if you're, if you're wondering why does God seem to answer some prayers the way that we expect and not answer other prayers the way that we expect, my encouragement is to go back to our Teach Us to Pray series. Pastor Sean preached an incredible message and spent a whole Sunday morning talking around the topic of unanswered prayer. Why we sometimes get a yes, other times we get a no, and other times we get a not yet in prayer. And since Pastor Sean touched on this topic far more in depth, I just want to say a couple of things to, towards this idea of unanswered prayer today. The first is the, the, this quote from Pastor Tim Keller, and it says this, God gives us everything we would have asked for if we knew everything that he knew. We have to acknowledge that our perspective is limited, and there is still some mystery as to why some of our prayers don't get answered the way that we would hope or expect for them to be. And in the midst of unanswered prayer, I think we can take Jesus' words as comfort and as encouragement today when he says this, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This is the posture of our Father. We have a Father in heaven who wants to give good things to his children. That is his character. And if we ever have a doubt about what, what lengths God will go to to bless his children and to do good things for his children, all we have to do is look to the cross where God poured out all of himself in love for you and I in giving his life for us so that we may have life. Even though we didn't deserve it and couldn't earn it, Jesus gave his life so that we might have life. And that is the length that God is willing to go to for his children. And it's why he loves us coming back to him time and time again with what's on our hearts and being persistent in prayer. And so the second question that I want to ask this morning is a bit more reflective. You don't have to add it to the chat if you don't want to. But the second question that I want to ask this morning is, what worry or heavy burden can you ask your father with help for today? What are you carrying on your heart and on your shoulders that has just been so heavy that maybe today you can finally take off your back and you can actually give to your father in heaven? So I want to give you a moment to just reflect on that. Is there something that you're carrying today that you can give to your father?
Well, I hope you had a good moment for reflection there. We now arrive at verse 12 from a passage that we read earlier that says this, Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now, I don't know about you, but in reading this passage today, this kind of seems like a verse that almost comes out of nowhere. It seems like Jesus is spending time talking about prayer, talking about our relationship with our Father and being invited to persist in prayer. And then he just kind of pivots to what seems like something completely different to talk about. That's how I read it at first, but there's a really important tie to the passage that precedes this. Remember the example that I gave earlier about not wanting to bother our prime minister with a parking ticket during COVID-19? Well, I think that we need to remember that when we are approaching our Heavenly Father, it's not like approaching our prime minister. Our Heavenly Father is able to be concerned about every single person in this world all at the same time. I mean, think about that. There are over 7 billion people on this planet and our Father in heaven cares about each and every one of them individually, equally at the same time. I I have a challenge caring about 10 people, let alone 7 plus billion well. Now this brings us back to the context of our verses 7 to 11 being tied to verse 12. Think about how much God cares for us. If your mind is not blown by the fact that he can care for 7 billion plus people all at the same time, I don't know what will blow your mind. The God that we serve is a God of love. And he is so full of love that he is able to be focused on sharing this self-giving love with the entire world. And in verse 12, Jesus is inviting us to share that same kind of love with everyone that we come into contact with. In Matthew chapter 5, at the end of chapter 5, Jesus says this phrase, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And this is a, a further way of saying that, that just as you understand that our Father in heaven wants to give good things and to bless everyone and be caring and concerned towards others, Jesus is inviting us to have even a fraction of that kind of care and concern for others. And the way that Jesus invites us to this is almost deceptively simple. He gives us one sentence that sums up all of the law and the prophets, which is a shorthand way of saying the Old Testament. In one sentence, Jesus sums up what the whole Old Testament is about. And here's what the sentence is. Whatever you want others to do for you, do that for them. Elsewhere, he says it as love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And this phrase has become known as the golden rule. Now, when when I think of the idea of rules, generally there are two kind of camps of people and how they respond to rules. The first camp of people are, are people like my wife who love rules. This is a direct quote from my wife. I have not yet found a rule that I didn't want to follow. If you are a rule follower, you love rules because you believe that they're there for a reason. You believe that they're there for the better good. You believe that they are worth following because the person who implemented them put them there for the betterment of everyone. And then there is the second camp of people that we will affectionately call rule benders. And I would probably put myself into this category. At the extreme of this category, you have people who, if, they, if there's a rule in place, they immediately want to do the opposite. Those are the people that are kind of classified as rebels. If there's a rule in place, they don't want to follow it. To a little bit less of an extreme, you have people who, if there's a rule in place, and this is where I fall, they want to know why that rule is there. Is there a good reason for that rule? And generally, if there's a good reason for that rule, I am willing to follow it. But if it's a rule that hasn't been thought through or is not actually helpful in serving, sometimes I, I, I bend it. I'm not saying it's right. Remember last week's sermon on judging, okay? I'm not saying I'm right here. Pastor Sean told us not to judge each other, okay? But that is kind of where I fall sometimes. 
You can chime into the chat with which camp you fall into. Are you a rule follower or are you a rule bender? But the reason that I bring up these two kind of responses to rules are I want to I want us to rewind back 2,000 years and to think about how we would have responded to Jesus giving this new, what we have called the golden rule. I imagine if you are in the camp of rule followers, your initial response would have been like, yes, Jesus is giving us another rule. This is awesome. But then you find out that Jesus is actually taking 613 Old Testament rules and shrinking it down to one. Do to others what you would have them do to you. And you'd probably have a mixed reaction. You'd probably be like, that takes away some of the clarity that I had for every single situation and all the rules and laws that I could follow. If you were in in the rule follower camp, Jesus' summation down to one rule might have been challenging for you. Now, if you're a rule bender, on the other hand, maybe you are stoked about this at first as well. Instead of having to follow all 613 rules, you're like, yes, I can follow this one. But then you go and actually try and put it into practice. And that's where it becomes challenging. That's where it becomes difficult. You mean I have to actually think about other people in every single situation and circumstance? You mean I have to think about what they would want and do that for them, basically living out all 613 rules all at once. And what seems so simple actually is really challenging. As open as this rule is, it doesn't just give us free reign to do anything that we want. In Jesus reducing the Torah or the law down to one rule, Jesus does not abolish it or get rid of all the other rules. As he says earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, he came so that they may be fulfilled. And he is saying to us, you are fulfilling those laws when you live this out. Jesus reduced the law to its basics so that it was easy to understand. Do for others what you want them to do for you. And in tying it to verses 7 and 11, he is saying, this is the way your father has acted towards you. And now you are invited to act that way towards others. This golden rule is so simple, we can teach it to a child. Yet it is challenging and difficult to live out consistently. And if we're going to be people who live this golden rule out consistently, it's going to take at least three characteristics from us. It's going to take first creativity, and it's going to take empathy, and it's also going to take being action-oriented. First, living out the golden rule is going to take creativity. I love this idea that the golden rule is not a call towards simple living and not thinking about it, but it's actually a call towards using our imagination and our creativity in how we can love others well. We serve such a creative God, and if you doubt that, just look around you in this world. There is so much that has been created that is absolutely stunning and beautiful in our world. And he invites us as his image in this creation to step into our creativity and think about how we can love other people well. This is not a simple minimum requirement. This is an a call and an invitation to use our imagination in how we can serve and love other people like our Father in heaven serves and loves us. Living out the golden rule takes creativity. But living out the golden rule also takes empathy. Empathy is putting yourself in the other person's shoes, thinking about it from their perspective. There's, there's a TED Talk that was given around the golden rule, and the person in the TED Talk gave this illustration that if, if you were going to give someone a tie and you liked red ties, you would just simply give the person a red tie. Well, what happens if the person receiving the tie actually likes blue ties? That's actually not a very good rule. But his whole TED Talk missed the point. The point is not to just look at the world with your lens and then do whatever you think is best for everyone else. No, the call is towards empathy, putting yourself in the other person's shoes and thinking about what they might like. 
thinking about how they would want to be treated. And one of the things that we would all like is that someone would act with empathy towards us. They, they would try and see things from our perspective, try and understand how we see the world before they act. Empathy is absolutely critical to living out the golden rule well. One of the, uh, the things that I mentioned earlier was that Lindsay is someone who feels loved best with words of affirmation. And this is from a resource called the Five Love Languages. And we take couples through this resource when we're going to, into marriage preparation with them. And because the idea is if you don't know how the other person feels best loved, you're going to try and love them in the way that you think is best, but you might not actually be putting yourself in their shoes and loving them in a way that they feel best loved. And the love languages are there's words of affirmation, there is acts of service, there's physical touch, there is, oh, got to remember this, uh, physical touch, there is, oh, I already said words of affirmation, and gifts. Those are the five. And so those are the, the love, five love languages that we take couples through because everyone experiences love differently. And these actually flow over into to workplaces. These flow over into all areas of our lives, into relationships with your kids, actually trying to understand how the other person feels loved and feels cared for is so important. And so if you haven't checked out that resource, it's an incredible resource that can help put yourself into the, the shoes of somebody else. Living out the golden rule takes empathy. And finally, living out the golden rule takes action. One of the, the interesting things about the golden rule is that some form of it is kind of found in every single world religion. Uh, there is in almost every world religion that you can come across, there is some form of the golden rule. But the interesting thing about them is that they are almost always stated in the negative. If you wouldn't want something done to you, don't do that to somebody else. And a preacher named Bruxy Cavi said, that's not the golden rule. That's at best the silver rule. Because it doesn't lead us towards acting in love. It doesn't lead us towards being people who are action-oriented. It can actually lead us towards apathy. Because we think that we're acting lovingly by not doing things that we wouldn't want done towards us. But in reality, Jesus' call is so much more than that. Jesus' call is a call towards creative empathetic action, thinking about what the other person might want and then acting on that. It's not a call to just not do what you wouldn't want done to yourself, but it's a call to act and a call to love others well. The golden rule is creative empathy in action. Another way of saying it is the golden rule is a call to love. And today in our world, love is a word that has kind of become emotion-driven. In our English language, we only really have one word for love. And I can say that I mean, I can say that I love ice cream, and I can say that I love my wife, and I love God, but I probably mean very different things. At least I better mean different things when I say that I love ice cream and I love God. But in the, in, the, in the Greek language, there is a word for love that is called agape. And this is the self-giving kind of love. This is the putting the other person ahead of yourself kind of love. It's a love that is a choice. And this is something we need to come back to to understand that love is not just a motive. It is not just about our emotions driving our love. That's why when we hear the phrase, I fell out of love, it's a contradiction. Love is not just about feelings and emotions driving you, Those, though feelings and emotions can be good. Love is a choice, a choice to put yourself into the other person's shoes and to act on that. Because that is what our Father in heaven has done towards us. He has come to this earth in the form of Jesus and gave his life for us so that we may have life. Love is not just about doing what we feel. That's the difference between being a thermostat and being a thermometer. A thermometer just rises and falls based on the environment that it's in, while a thermostat stays consistent and steady. 
And Jesus is calling us to be people who are consistent and steady, calling us to be thermostats when it comes to love and living out the golden rule. It's not about just treating others the way that they treat us. It's about being people who place the golden rule into action, who seek to be creative and empathetic in the way that we love other people. And so for this week ahead, I want to give us a challenge and an application point. What would it be like for you to find one person this week to bless? To put yourself into their shoes and stop for a moment and reflect and say, okay, what, what could I do if I was in this situation? What would I want? What would I need? And if you want to find out, you can always ask the person as well. It's a great step. But what would it look like if our homes this week were homes where the golden rule was lived out? Where when your kids were getting on your nerves for what feels like the hundredth time during COVID-19, you stopped for a minute instead of responding with frustration and anger towards them. And instead, you tried to put yourself into their shoes for a minute. Try to think about how you can respond with, respond with kindness and compassion. Towards your coworkers at work, what would it look like if you were willing to put yourself into their shoes and to think about how your boss is feeling during COVID-19, the stress that they must be under? What would it look like to put yourself into your spouse's shoes if you have a significant other this week and think about how you can love and serve them this week ahead? What about the employees in stores that you go to if you're going out for groceries? Think about the fear that they must have. Think about the worry and how can you treat them with kindness and compassion? How can you encourage them in this week ahead? And so I want us to take one moment to just pause and reflect before we wrap up this morning. And think about this. This is our homework for the week as a church. Who is one person this week that you can bless? So I want you to think about this right now. Who is one person that you can respond to with creativity and empathy this week? So take one moment right now and just reflect on that and ask the Holy Spirit to bring someone to your mind. Well, I hope God spoke to you and gave you someone that you can show his love and his kindness to this week. This portion of scripture that we read today, Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12, can reveal a crack in our foundation. If we approach our faith thinking that it is just about us and God, thinking that it is about me individually and God, and that there's no tie towards loving other people well, that is a crack in our foundation of our faith. Our faith may be personal, that it is relational between us and God, but it is never private. It is never just about you and God and your relationship with God. It is communal. 
And God has placed us on this planet to love others well. And so when Jesus sums up all of the law and he says, love the Lord, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Or in our passage from today, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He is tying together those two important ideas. The vertical relationship with God and the horizontal relationship with others. If you want to see how you are loving God, it has to flow into how you love other people around you. Otherwise, you are only deceiving yourself. Love for God cannot be separated or divorced from love for others. And in this time of COVID-19, where we can be understandably focused on ourselves, one of the best things that we can do to combat that is to think about how we can love other people well. To think about how we can live out the golden rule and put ourselves in other people's shoes in the week ahead. It helps take our eyes off of ourselves and our problems and helps to focus on other people because God wants us today to be persistent in two things. He wants us to persist in bringing whatever is on our hearts and on our minds towards him because he loves us and he cares for us. And he also wants us to persist in being people who creatively and empathetically act towards others. People who live out the golden rule. So for the week ahead, church, who can you bless? Who can you show God's kindness and his love to? Because that is the life that Jesus invites us into, even in the midst of COVID-19. Would you pray with me today? If this morning, as you are listening to these words, you haven't known this love of the Father that we're talking about, you've never heard that God is loving towards you, and all you've thought about before when it comes to the idea of God is that there's someone waiting to just crush you, someone waiting to cast judgment on you, and you've never heard this picture of a compassionate and caring God who wants to give good things to his children, This morning, it would be my pleasure to pray for you and to invite you into a relationship and a life of following Jesus. Jesus gave his life for you on the cross so that you may have new life and right relationship with God. God loves you so much and he wants that right relationship for you to be received by you today. He wants to give you that gift today. It doesn't mean that following Jesus is going to be easy or that there won't be difficulties ahead, but it means that you know that you are loved by him. And so if that is you today, my encouragement is you're going to see a box in the corner that says, I want, to, I want that salvation today. I want to receive that gift that God has given to me today. And if you click that and, and follow through by, by giving us your name and your email, one of our pastors would love to follow up with you and give you a short resource as you start your journey of faith today. And for the rest of us this morning as well, God, I pray that you would give us, Lord, creativity in the week ahead. That we would not just coast by on bare minimums when it comes to how we can love and serve the people around us, but that, God, you would give us imagination for all the creative ways that we can bless our neighbors, that we can serve our families, that we can serve healthcare workers and people who are stressed out and anxious at work still currently, Lord that we can think about how we can reach out and bless other people because Jesus, you have saved us and you have called us to be your image on this earth, to show people what your love is practically and tangibly like. And so God, help us to live that out this week. Not to just enforce our will on other people, but to have empathy and to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Help us to, Lord, not just sit back and be passive, but help us to be active bringing our prayer requests to you instead of just carrying them on our own back and active in loving other people well. Thank you, Jesus, for this passage of scripture today. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to put it into action in this week ahead. In your name, Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. Well, we love you, church, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. We'll see you again next week.